On Monday, February 6, 1995, in the rural Lewis County, Tennessee town of Hohenland, the beaten, bloody body of 18-year-old Christy Ling Carroll was discovered by the mail carrier. It had been dumped by two local teenage boys, Daniel Lay and Derek Amaker. The temperature was well below freezing Sunday night. The body is that of a well-developed, well-nourished, unclothed, uncircumcised white female, consistent with stated age of 18 years. The height is 63 inches above the heel. The weight is 139 pounds. The eyes are brown. The hair is brown. Mustache and beard are absent. Rigor mortis is present. Liver mortis is purple and fixed. Cyanosis is present. There's bloody fluid coming from the mouth and nose. Seven rings are present on the fingers. There is an abrasion of the chin. There is a tomahawk tattoo present on the dorsum of the left wrist. On the preceding Saturday night, Carol had been in town with her friend Kim Burleson at a bar. She had planned to spend that night at Burleson's house. At 11.20 p.m., Carol's brother Ted and three of his friends stopped by to talk. Carol asked them to give her and Burleson a ride to Burleson's house. The driver, John, said that he couldn't because he had to pick up his mother at 11.30 p.m. Burleson found another ride home. Carol, thinking she could convince the boys to take her to Burleson's later, stayed with her brother. They drove around for a few minutes and then saw Leigh and Amaker, who said they would give her a ride. At 11.56 p.m., Deputy Lloyd Sherman and another officer saw a car pulled off the highway roughly halfway between the Carroll and Burleson residences and stopped to investigate. In the car were Lay, Amaker, and Carroll. Lay told the officers that the car had overheated but refused any offer of help. The same night, at 2 a.m., police responded to a call concerning a man wandering along a road close to the earlier incident. The individual was Eric Amaker. He had wrecked a car and was leaving the scene. The car was yet another vehicle than the one he had been in with Lay and Carol. On Monday, February 6th, Carol's body was found laying behind the mailbox, beside the driveway of her home. She was barefoot. Her face was covered with blood. Her arms were outstretched. Her blouse was pulled up above her stomach and was ripped in the front and back. Her pants legs were pulled up past her knees. She was, by reasonable observation, a girl who had been raped and beaten to death. Both Lay and Amaker gave statements to the local police. They said that they had asked Carol to have sex with them, but that she had refused. Their statements conflicted in essence and in content. First, they said that they had dropped Carol off at her house between 12.30 and 1 a.m. on Saturday night. Amaker said that he had walked her to the door and she went inside. Less than two hours later, he gave another statement, saying that they dropped her off halfway up her driveway and that she was walking towards the house when they left. Later, both boys said that as they were driving away, they saw Carol fall in the driveway. Amaker later called the police and told them he had something that he wanted to tell them. When the police arrived at his house to take his statement, Amaker's mother met them at the door with phone in hand, saying that she had a lawyer on the line. Amaker was not allowed to speak what was on his mind. There is a day missing in this chain of events. Sunday, February 5th, 1995. Carol was a beloved child somewhere in that restless age between dependent minor and fully fledged adult. She was, as we all must do, learning to fly from the nest. Her mother, thinking that she was safe at Burleson's house, decided not to press the issue of her whereabouts on Sunday. The police told the media that Carol's body was found in a ditch. No such a ditch exists on the property of that house. Carol's mother was in and out of the driveway two times on Sunday. There was no snow on the ground and visibility was optimal. The official version of events is dependent upon one's belief that a mother never noticed the body of her daughter laying on the ground only feet from where her car passed four times. There were several family friends up and down the driveway that day. Not a single one of them noticed a corpse not too far from the front door. The autopsy on Carol was performed in Nashville by Dr. Charles Harland. Dr. Harland was, at the time, officially barred from performing autopsies due to an ongoing investigation of malfeasance. He did not perform the most basic tests to determine whether or not Carol had been raped. He did not suggest a time of death. The autopsy records two different blood alcohol levels, one of 0.01, the other 0 0.10. 20 cc's of coffee ground fluid were found in Carol's stomach. Coffee ground fluid is cornolingo for coagulated blood, possibly the result of a beating. The autopsy and the death certificate 
are virtually meaningless as evidential documents. The sheriff's department asked both boys to take lie detector tests. They refused. The deputy assigned to the case, W.C. Ham, told the grand jury that he was unaware that Carol's blouse was torn. Ham's memory is faulty. Carol's mother made audio tapes of various police interviews that recorded, among other blatant discrepancies, Ham's inconsistent testimony. In October of 1995, Eric Amaker again tried to confess the truth of his involvement in Carol's death. He asked for immunity. District Attorney Joe Bowe refused. Daniel Lay is kin to Lewis County Sheriff Dwayne Kilpatrick. Eric Amaker's family is on close terms with former Assistant District Attorney Donald W. Schwinderman and local TBI agent Jerry Tannery. Agent Tannery conducted an almost non-existent investigation into the matter. He told Christie's mother that he knew the Amaker family very well. He said that Eric was a good boy. There's a street in Hohenwald named Amaker Avenue. It's on the right side of the tracks. The Lewis County Sheriff's Department talked to the investigator for the district attorney's office. He said that he was willing to investigate. Jobo would not allow that. The Carrolls tried in vain to get the assistant DA to perform some simple diagnostics. For example, Miss Carroll noticed mud on Christie's body that didn't appear to have come from the location where she supposedly fell for the first time. She asked him to have comparative soil tests done to confirm this theory. He told Lois Carroll that he wouldn't do that. Such attention to detail was just TV stuff. Within a year after the murder, Christie's 17-year-old brother, Ted, was brought before the 21st Circuit Court regarding his alleged involvement in a fistfight. The sitting judge was Cornelia Clark, and a properly functioning judicial environment with even the most rudimentary precepts of ethics, Clark would have recused herself from this case in light of her personal relationship with Joe Bowe. She did not. The testimony against Ted Carroll came largely from a young man and his girlfriend who had a record of using and dealing cocaine. The man is accepted by most to be an informant for the DA's office and maintains his relative freedom by helping that office to get convictions. He said that Carroll had beaten him and threatened his life. The defense testimony included a statement by a veteran school teacher who was highly respected and trusted in the community. Her version of the events described a situation that made it virtually impossible for Carroll to have been guilty. She was mocked. It was insinuated that she was a liar and an incompetent. Cornelia Clark sentenced Ted Carroll to three years in jail. He did for months. Clearly a warning shot across the bow of the Carroll family. Be quiet. Let it go. There's plenty more where this came from. The situation of Clark and Joe Bo's relationship and the subsequent invalidation of hundreds, if not thousands, of court trials that they have been mutually involved in is somewhat of a Pandora's box in the 21st district. It is the unspeakable. It is being attentively ignored but it will inevitably have to be faced.